the podcast makes it about you. It makes it about the entrepreneur that's trying to grow a business. And so it allows them to tell their story. It gives them a platform, right? And so that's for me more of the reason for the push. Most hosts never achieve the results they hoped for. They're falling short on listenership and monetization, meaning their message isn't being heard and their show ends up costing them money. This podcast was created to help you grow your listenership and make money while you're at it. Get ready to take notes. Here's your host, Adam Adams. Hey, podcaster. It's Adam Adams. And today I'm joined with Gary Harper. Gary and I have been connected for years and years on social and haven't had a lot of chances to talk. So this is kind of an opportunity for me. He's a business coach. He not only helps other people have businesses, but he walks the talk, meaning he has 10, 12, 18 businesses at a time. He buys them, he sells them, he starts them. And interestingly enough, he launched a podcast before COVID. And then around COVID, he slowed down the podcast and eventually paused it. And a few years later, now he's getting back into the podcast. And so you should be taking this from today. You should be thinking, all right, somebody who's super successful, bought and sold businesses, launched businesses, um, makes a lot of money and has their hands in a few different places, thought that it was so important to do a podcast that they are coming back to it at, even after a short hiatus of a couple of years. And why is that? What is he looking for? What is he doing? And how can you, the listener, implement that stuff as well? So Gary, I'm stoked to have you on the podcast. Like I said to the listener, I've been admiring you, following you. I know what you're doing is really awesome. It sounds like you've been the business coach of some other people that I also look up to. So really good stuff. And I want to jump into that. So the big overarching part of your business is this word sharper, sharper yep. process, sharper personnel, sharper ministry, sharper venture, sharper education. Tell us a little bit about, and I don't usually ask any guests this, Gary. Right. So you're just lucky. You're just All lucky. Right. I, like you. um, I never want people to just tell us about themselves. And I think that's important for our listener as well. Because when we launch podcasts, when we start a podcast, when we have somebody on, I usually never say, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me a little bit about your background or how did you get into this? I think it's a boring first question in general, but it is really interesting with you. And I think it will be able to play into some of the questions that we ask as well. So do you mind sharing with the listener, like why Sharper, kind of what is your background? How did you get to where you are? And then we'll get into the podcast journey. Absolutely. So early, the late 90s, I got into just understanding the importance of real estate and creating passive income through different systems that are out there, Carlton Sheets and things like that. And then Rich Dad, Poor Dad book and started my journey about the same time in corporate America. So I was running these two parallels in real estate, trying to be an investor, and then also the parallel of trying to build a career in the corporate world and was successful in one. I'll get let you guess at which one I was successful in. No, I actually I was successful in building an entrepreneur or a uh, a corporate America job. I mean, that's where I was. I actually made it to executive level, had over 750 employees throughout the Midwest, and real estate wasn't actually wasn't really good at it. And so by 2011, I actually lost my shirt and decided I was never going to get back into a real estate transaction ever again, as many entrepreneurs did in 2008 to 2010. And success in my corporate America job was right in front of me. So I started to chase that. And then I think God had a little different plan for me than my own intention. I got bit by a tick. I came down with Lyme's disease, almost passed away in 2011. And so that journey of success, entrepreneurship was paused very quickly. Took about a year off, found myself like really, really missing out on the opportunity to have passive income to kind of carry me through that year. Started as I got better, started to get dabbling back into real estate. And then I made the decision in 2012 to go full time into real estate instead of chasing my American dream as a corporate executive. So I essentially retired from being a corporate exec, went into real estate full time, partnered with my brother in law, bought and sold over uh, 300 houses a year together. When did that start with your brother in law? 2012. Okay. So in 2010 or 11, you were like, screw this real estate, I'm never touching it. And then never. 2012, you're flipping hundreds of houses. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't quite hundreds in 2012. It okay. worked it up to it. By the time I stopped doing real estate actively again, it was 2016. And we were doing over 300 deals a year then. So it was definitely scaled to that level at that point. And then I found myself, you know, 
where my pure love was. And I think just like everything in life, things, your experiences bring a passion. Your past brings a love for something. And so I found myself combining the coaching with real estate. And so I started in on the journey of trying to coach real estate investors how to build a business, not do a deal. Like I don't talk to really people about how to do a deal, right? How to buy and sell houses. I teach people how to buy, you know, how to build a business, even buy and sell businesses. And now outside of the world of just real estate, we're helping hundreds of people every year with their business and how to grow it properly. We like to say, help you rise to your 100%. And so I've been doing that since 2016, going on eight years now. And we've helped over 2,000 businesses in the last seven and a half years. When you say 2,000 businesses, how do you like measure a number? Is it if they bought a book? Is it if you did a personal coaching or what gets the 2,000 people that you had help? So that I've had to coach them in one capacity or another, whether it's one of our power days, our full circle, or one of our events that they've come to, where I actually stood in front of the room to coach them, or one of our coaches has coached them. So okay. we don't really consider it helping them if they read a book or they've listened to a podcast or anything. We think that's valuable for sure. But I always look at it in three categories, inspire, influence, and impact. And so when I talk about the 2000, those are businesses that we've touched, we've tried to impact them. Okay. Inspire, influence, impact. I'm yeah. thinking about this because I frequently talk to with my listener mm -hmm. and I say income and impact are like the big things that a lot of people start podcasts for. That means to me that they either want to make an impact on other people, basically giving away, leaving their legacy or they want to make uh, money. So they want sponsors or they want to sell their own product or service. And for inspire, influence, and impact, where do these... Because a couple of them start with eyes, just like my two eyes over here. Um, where do these come from? Like, Who are you talking with about inspire, influence, and impact? Is this for your podcast? Is this for your business? Is it for other people's businesses? What about that? Yeah. So when I'm coaching, right, you're trying to help somebody reach their purpose. And so like if I'm coaching a team or coaching an individual that's a social media influencer or they're trying to use a podcast or things like that, obviously, I'm trying to find out what their purpose is, right? Like what is their 100%? What are they trying to do? And so different purposes will drive one of those three areas. If you're trying to inspire someone, right, the inspiration can happen in seconds. You know, influence, somebody has to actually start to follow you to influence them, right? But they have to actually consume and implement your content to impact them, right? They have to take action. And so like, what are we trying to do? We're trying to drive to just inspire because we can do that in our sharper studios by bringing in and then putting together short form content that inspires people, right? But influence, now you have to start getting into a podcast. You have to start getting into long form content. You have to actually start gaining a following, influence people impact somebody takes that influence and takes action on it right and so those are the three areas that we're coaching and talking to our businesses uh, that we're coaching with and trying to get them to see like which category do you want to live in and not every person i come in contact with wants to impact others some people just want to inspire and the reason for that is you can inspire millions like you can inspire a large magnitude of people in a short period of time where impact takes time mm -hmm. When I think through them and, and in a way, and not in all of the ways, when you share with me that you're helping people inspire, influence, and impact, and they kind of focus on one or the other, in some ways, I think about a funnel. I'm kind of imagining a funnel, and the inspire is kind of like at the very, very top of the funnel, yeah. and that's the easiest thing to do to reach the most amount of people. And then influence is like after they kind of subscribe to your podcast or yeah. something like this. And then impact is when they actually hire your company and then you can make a stronger impact on them. Do you ever think of it like a funnel that way 100%. or am I? Okay. 100%. That's your exact, you're thinking the exact same way that I would hope you would here. So like inspire and then depending on my customer, if I'm coaching, like if they're wanting to just inspire, then we build their funnel to just inspire, right? Like it's just to that point. Then influence, it's like, okay, now we want to push them to longer form content, like on YouTube and things like that because we want it or our podcast, right? Like we want them there. And a lot of times we'll get people to create a podcast that's video form as well. So they can go on their YouTube and also go on, you know, a podcast station. And so that is what we're trying to push towards because we're trying to create influence, right? We're trying to get more followers. 
from that, it's like, are, okay, do you have a product that you're trying to drive them to? Are you trying to get them to where you can spend more time or giving them more education or they purchase an online product or something that actually impacts them that they can take action with? And yeah. so those are the, depending on where they want that funnel to stop is what we're coaching them towards. And we call that their 100%. Okay, cool. And you mentioned, and I would guess that a podcast or some type of thought leadership platform is mm -hmm. part of that. Gary, yeah. you have a few books, at least two that are you're writing right now, I think. Is that right? That's correct. Are being published. And so books are seem like a piece of thought leadership where it's important. And additionally, you've got the podcast. Right. And you started in 2019. Then in 2020, I think your companies got kind of busy, it sounds like. Yeah. And so you held off on the podcast until late 2023. Right, yeah, right. And it's feeling like this is a big deal to you, like you need to do it, like you should do it. And even though you got like 13 companies going strong and money's coming in, you still feel like the podcast is an important thing for what you guys are doing in your different companies. So I want to find out how does the podcast connect with you or your businesses? So how does it connect? And also like why restart it? Why is it so important to you? Oh, that's a great question. Honestly, Adam, here's the thing. In 2020, when COVID hit, we did get really busy. Businesses got really, what we call, not just the world got sick, businesses got sick. I actually released a book that year called, Is Your Business Sick? And so like, it was really important to understand like businesses were getting ill as well, right? They were unhealthy. And so we had to spend a lot of our time, money, resources on pouring back into those businesses. And so it got really busy for us. Now, at that time, it was a lot of the coaching was just being done by me and a few others. We've scaled to like over 10 coaches now, 10 or 30, I think we're at like 13 or 14 coaches, to be honest. And I think right now it's about, you know, hitting our purpose. Our purpose is to do a good work that gives back to God's work, right? So that's our purpose. And so we want to be able to give $2.6 million to God's work by 2026. In order to do that, we've got to open up our funnel in order to get more in, to help more, to impact more. Because if we don't impact, then we're not doing a good work. And the way I'm set up is my products are set up that I don't charge in full until the end of my coaching, like at the end of our first 90 days, because I want to be able to measure that we did a good work. Everything, all decisions I make are measured around that purpose. Does it support the purpose? The business I start, does it help you get me closer to my purpose? The podcast, does it help get me closer to my purpose? And in order to hit the 2.6 million, then I have to influence a lot of people. In order mm. to influence a lot of people, I need to inspire even more, right? And hopefully that funnels people down into a product that then we can impact them with. And if we do a good work with the right way in impacting them, right? Not a great work, a good work, then we can then in return be paid. And then in return for that, give back to God's work. But I don't want to be known as a guru, right? I don't want to be known as someone who's out there pushing a message, false hope, things like that, and then getting paid for it and then running off with it. I want to be able to measure that we did a good work by receiving payment at the end of the service. Now, we do ask for a deposit and we ask for things to get some level of commitment from people, but we don't actually charge in full on our power days till the end of the 90 day implementation that we're doing with our business operating system. And then everything after that's a monthly cost that allows people to, to drop out if they're not getting value. So like there's nothing that ever locks people into our program so we can keep them in the area of doing a good work. So the podcast, right? Why a podcast? Well, because if we're going to impact the number of people we need to in order to do a good work at that level, in order to get enough to give back to God's work, then we have to have a bigger reach, right? And we have to have a reach that's not just real estate. Same reason for the books that I'm writing right now, right? Both of the books I'm writing right now are around the business operating framework of RISE, resources, inspiration, systems, and engagement. One's a fable, one's a tactical book. And so the goal with that tactical book is to get it in enough people's hands. Here's the thing, I, something I struggled with the other day. Two publishers have offered me to publish our book. One I probably will go with has come at me with the idea of why do I want to publish a book, right? And again, everything goes back to my purpose. And their response to me was, there's two ways to go about publishing your book. One is we could publish it, put it on our bookshelf, see what happens with it, see where it goes. Two, we could keep the price really low on the book and push it to thousands of people. Now, would it make it a bestseller? Possibly. 
I'm not looking at that for that reason. I'm looking at that because it gives me opportunity to put this qualified, quality, good work into a book form that gets it to thousands and thousands and maybe hundreds of thousands of people, right? And make it acceptable. And I thought about that. Like, does it cheapen the value of it? What does it do for it? And at the end of the day, the goal, the purpose is to get this good work in as many people's hands as possible. What does a podcast do? Podcast takes content, audible book content, and puts it in people's hands at the cheapest cost possible, right? So what better way to reach an audience, to influence, inspire, and impact others and the millions of people avenue than a podcast, right? Yeah. What better way to push back to and give back to people that are struggling? And that's that's what I call good work. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree. I agree 100%. And so I'm glad to hear that the podcast is part of your business strategy. And I'm thinking through like you going back to the podcast. I'm thinking through like all of the stuff that you probably have going on. I mean, with family, with a bunch of different businesses. Is it? challenging to go back to the podcast? Are you crazy busy or how do you find the time with everything else that you got going on? So the business podcast is designed to help other business entrepreneurs rise right to their 100%. And one of the ways we can do that really easy is through example, right? Example of other people's stories. The nice thing about the podcast for me is one, it's not about me. (laughs) <laughs> right? Like, it's not about me. And I feel like a lot of our businesses, when I speak on stage, even beyond this podcast, it's always like, Gary, tell us about your story. And honestly, I don't want it about me, right? Like, it's not about me. It's about the purpose, about why I'm doing it, what I want it about. And so the podcast makes it about you. It makes it about the entrepreneur that's trying to grow a business. And so it allows them to tell their story. It gives them a platform, right? And so that's, for me, more of the reason for the push So like at the end of the day, it's like, how busy are you? How do you make time for this? Well, we make time for things we value. If you value getting the content out to people to help people and give back, and we value our purpose, then we're going to use it. What I would discourage somebody from doing is starting a podcast just because they want to feed an ego. Like you'll be humbled really fast starting a podcast. There's a lot of negatives out there. There's a lot of ugly people out there. There's a lot of people want to attack you. Like you got to stay pretty grounded in the right reasons for starting a podcast and putting yourself Mm. out there. Same thing with any social platform. I like that. So with your podcast, one of the things that I think you're also starting more businesses Mm -hmm. now, and we talked about this in the green room before actually pushing the record button. And were you making like 50 different podcast studios throughout the United States right now? Is that so focused? What are you doing those for? So the Sharper Studios, it's a company of ours. I'm actually sitting in it today. This is part of it. There's about seven different setups in here. We can change it up and move things around. I got big LED boards and infinity walls and everything like that in here. Why? Because entrepreneurs today, in order to grow and scale, you have to have influence, right? You have to inspire. You have to get your content out there. And entrepreneurs don't have a place for that. They don't have a place. You know, it's funny. It's actually worked out really well. I started this green room with you. I was at a different location and you're like, hey, like the mic you have, I don't know that I like it. What about this mic? Do you have something different? And I'm like, you know, Adam, honestly, I can just go to my studio. Like I should have been there anyway. So like, what if I didn't have that? Yeah. Yeah. And the quality wouldn't have been good. Maybe my message gets drowned out by lack of good quality video, lack of quality audio, like Maybe people don't stay interested because it's not good quality listening, right? You know, maybe the content's there, but the quality of the content or the way we're delivering it is not good. And so it's that stuff is front of mind for me. And so I think it's important for people to have a place and a space to go where they don't have to figure out all this stuff and they don't have to figure out the lights and they don't have to figure out the setting. They don't have to figure out the camera. They don't have to figure out the mics. You just walk in, you sit down, hit record, and somebody produces it. Part of Sharper Studios on the back end is I have Sharper Marketing, another company that has VAs and publications and things like that. And then we take their podcast, we cut it for them, and we produce it, right? So we do that with all their media, whether it's podcasts or it's recordings, you know, short and long form content. And so like we have a software called Social Brand Pro that my partner in my business, Brandon McCurdy, developed and engineered. It does all the scheduling of that stuff, right? So it's it's just a way to get people... I found... Adam, that people don't take action as entrepreneurs because they have fear. Yeah, I agree. 100%. So the reason for the Sharper Studios is to replace fear with knowledge. 
So to be clear, I'm trying to make sure that I understand this because I know that you have worked with more than 2,000 business owners throughout the country over the last few years. And I'm also thinking through a lot of the coaching that you serve business owners with. It sounds like you are passionate about that a podcast is a really good part of that business. And so now that I'm thinking through those pieces that I know and understand about what you've been doing, it makes me go into this podcast studio idea where you're doing in 50 states and is something where I'm like, is this mainly for the people that Gary's team already works for and is already suggesting that they have podcasts for their things? Or is it more independent where it's for any business owner, whether however they got to you, just as another business that you're starting? Yeah. So it's the latter. It's the second part. It's building studios where your average business, your entrepreneur in the local community could come and record, right? So would it be available for our students and our clients? Absolutely. That's not the client avatar of that organization. That company has its own visionary, its own business unit leader. Dylan, who's actually with us today, is here. And he's a business unit leader for the studios. And his job and their job is to push entrepreneurs or social media influencers into the studio for content recording. And so it's not just Gary Harper's clients or Sharper Business Solutions. It's Sharper Studios clients and their clients is the business right next door. These studios set in shopping centers or malls around the country close to your entrepreneurs, right? Like next door to us is a Mexican restaurant and the other side is a dog grooming place. And then there's edible arrangements right here. And they all they all need that reach, right? We all need some level of marketing and content. The other thing is Amazon warehouses that we have an affinity wall where they come in and they take pictures of their products. We're on the websites and other companies that need pictures of products, put it on the affinity wall, cuts down their editing. So the studios is a one-stop shop for media solutions, right? And that's what the push is. And it's for any entrepreneur that's out there, whether you've got 500 employees or it's just you alone. You're a realtor and you're trying to get content to your avatar. And so that's what it's for. And for the local Joe and the local community, that's just trying to figure out a way to reach his audience. And then your plan is that your team is doing all the editing as well and publishing of this content? Yep. That's what they do now. Okay, cool. And right now you're at one studio and then your plan is to get to the other 50 or where are you today? So every business I start, I start with resources, which is time, money, and people. And so I predetermine amount of time to allow the business to succeed or fail. Next is how much money do I need to start and how much money do I need to make? I create a performa. The third thing is what resources and people do I need, right? What people do I need to make this thing happen? And I beta test it for that time frame. So that predetermined time. And in that time frame, I either make the money, break even, or I lose. And if I lose, then I may shut it down. I might re-engineer it and re-go at it for six more months. The framework or the time frame that I've put around the Sharper Studios is two years. So a two-year beta of the studio we have right now to break even or make money, prove the concept, and then we'll launch the other 49. That probably gave at least one listener a bit of anxiety. I want to hear your thoughts on this because it's probably realistic to think of a lot of businesses in that two-ish year phase in order to start really making money. I've had businesses, not as many as you, but a lot have failed and some have done okay. Mm -hmm. um, And a couple have done great. Mm -hmm. And as I start businesses, as I launch businesses, my expectation most of the time, Gary, is I'm going to be a millionaire tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to launch this today and my life's going to be easy tomorrow. And I'm hearing you say that this is a two-year beta with one studio, and then we're going to see where it goes after two years, and then decide on the other 49 studios after. If we have a listener who's thinking, I'm going to start a business, and tomorrow I'm going to be a multimillionaire, my life will be set. Hmm. What should we be thinking when we're launching a brand new business? Those three things, time, money, and people. So... I have plenty of business ideas that I'd start tomorrow, but I don't have the people to run them. And I don't want to be a resource to my own company. You ask about like how I have time to do all this. It's because I'm not a resource. I don't sit in my companies. I now have a seat in my companies. I am the CEO of the ecosystem, our holdings company. I have business unit leaders, COOs, CMOs, all those people that run the business. 
I have the freedom to set any seat that I want to sit in. I actually only choose, of all my businesses, the only actual one that I still sit in, that seat-wise, is as a consultant. I actually do it because I enjoy it. I enjoy consulting businesses still. I have 13 other business consultants. I don't have to. To be truthfully honest with you, I had a client this week that wanted me, and I'm like, no, I don't really want to go out of town this week, right? So just decided not to, and they took another coach, which was fine, and they were happy with that. I just didn't want to go out of town this week. I wanted to rest and relax and have a good week. I've taken three weeks off now. I haven't coached or traveled in three weeks just because that's what I chose to do. So with that being said, like you got a predetermined time. Now, I gave you a marker of two years. That's to prove the concept. If I prove the concept in six months, I launch the second studio. If I prove the mm-hmm. concept in nine months, I launch the second studio. It's just the time in which I'm dedicating and putting the money aside to be successful in two years. Why? Because I've done a study to find what would be a typical time frame of a successful product like this. Yeah. Because technology changes too fast to be like five years from now, I should be making money. No, five years from now, the whole concepts change by then. So I've got to get there a little quicker. There are some businesses I start that I launch in 90 days and they're successful. They ramp at that point. They go to the next. People are always scared of like failure in business. And the truth is that you hear the statement a lot, you grew too fast, right? And that's not a true statement. Really what happens is we grow wrong. And that's where our business framework comes in, our coaching comes in, because we help businesses rise to their 100% the right way. We start with resources, time, money, people. Then we go into inspiration. Then we go into systems. And then we go into engagement. And this podcast and things like that are engagement, right? That is where we're trying to engage with the outside world in marketing, sales, advertising, things like that. That's a whole piece of our curriculum on engagement. And so we want to make sure we've done the resource, inspiration, and systems properly before we expand into engagement and get there. We call it earning the right. We ETR it to engagement. We earn the right to engage. I had somebody text me this morning, Adam, and they're like, hey, I want to be a business coach for you. I'm like, okay, could you give me your resume or text me and let me know why you think you're qualified to be a business coach? He's like, well, because I want to. Okay. And I want to be president of the United States someday. doesn't mean I'm qualified yet, right? Like, I think you got to be qualified. You have to earn the right to be a subject matter expert, right? In something. And so like, that's what we're trying to protect. We're trying to protect people from having that false sense of accomplishment and security because they jump on social media and they push a message and they have no back into it, no support, no actual experience with it. So that's our goal. I mean, our goal is to help entrepreneurs rise properly. And if you're out there today and you're thinking about starting a podcast, you know, start with why, what's your purpose? What are you trying to accomplish? And if you're trying to build a business from it, you better dial in your resources, your time, money, your people. Then you also better make sure you have the right vision, long-term, short-term vision that inspires those resources. And then you better make sure you have the right systems in the book, Who Not How. It's a great example of why we built Rise the way we built it. It's who, then how. Systems show up after inspiration. And then if you do those three things right, you have the right to expand through engagement. I want to ask, and I'm hoping this could be valuable to a listener. I had an idea. So I don't know if you love the idea or don't love the idea, but just I don't think that that part matters so much. But I had an idea where there's something called, a lot of people are calling biohacking right now. And biohacking is like getting sunlight in the morning or using infrared lights, massage therapy, cold exposure, heat exposure, some of these things. Yep. And for me at my house, I buy ice, bags of ice every few days, and I'll do ice baths just in my own bathtub. And I've got a sauna in the basement, and then I put a bunch of infrared lights on there. And so I try to do some cold exposure most of the morning, some heat exposure most of the nights. And There's a lot of people, not so much in Colorado, but certainly in other states, Alaska would be a good example. Seattle might be another, where they can't get enough sunlight. They can't get the adequate amount of sunlight for their vitamin D and things like this, their melatonin, their moods, et cetera. So my goal, my thought was I'm passionate about this biohacking thing, and I'd like to have like ice baths and red light infrared light saunas in one place. Mm -hmm. How do I go about my idea using your three things? I think it was 
time, money, and people. Mm-hmm. How do I go about this to decide if I should launch a business like this in a strip mall similar to your recording studio? Again, what's the purpose? You start with passion or purpose. What would you like to accomplish by doing that? I would like to help people be healthier and not have to pay for all of these things at their house. If you have an ice bath at your house, it's expensive. They cost $12,000. And then you got to like maintain it and all this kind of stuff. Keep it clean. Same thing with saunas. Like Not everybody has the ability to do that. So the real passion is bringing that to people like you with your recording studio, mm-hmm. where you're like, you don't want them to be able to have the excuse not to do these things that are good for them. On your side, it's making sure that they can record and have it all edited and they don't have to figure it out. On my end, it's like just the infrared light sauna. Just if you're using the real infrareds, it's like $20,000 for one sauna. A lot of people don't have that amount of money. And so it's like bringing it to lots of people, making sure lots of people can have the benefits, but they don't have to pay the high dollars to get there. Yeah. No, it's a really good idea. I have an infrared sauna in my house. I have ice baths. I have all that as well. And I think the average person out there, A, doesn't know the benefits to it. So I think you'd have to, part of your time is how much time would you need to educate the right avatar to drive them into the business? So you'd have to start with time. How much time are you going to give this to make sure it gets traction and gets where it's actually a popular product or it's driving your avatar in? Next thing would be what people do you need, right? Like what people, what experts do you need? What subject matter expert do you need? Do you need a doctor? Do you need a nurse? Do you need somebody who studies holistic medicine or, you know, ways to heal the body? Like what resources do you need? Because what you don't want to do here as an entrepreneur is be the resource, right? It's quicksand. The biggest problem I see with entrepreneurs coaching them is when they start a business, they start the business right? And they get stuck in seats. And when you're in seats in the company, you are a resource to the company. And when you own other companies and you're doing other things like I do, I cannot be a resource to one company. Because if I'm a resource to one company, then I'm robbing the other companies of my time. So I will not start a business without hiring my business unit leader and my resources of people first. Okay. So now I get some money. What do I need money-wise to buy the equipment, to get Lisa's place, to hire the resources and pay those resources. Yeah. So we create what we call a business performa, a performer that has projections of how much revenue we think we'll make by month for the first year, the second year, and the third year, or whatever time frame you've determined. And a space like yours, I would give that time frame like my studios, like a two year time frame, right? And so I would need to figure out how much my costs would be to lease a space to pay the people for two years, invest in the equipment, all the capital expenditures of it, and depreciating that capital expenditures over those two years. And then I would figure out how much money I need to make and by what month I need to make that to start breaking even or to start making money to consider this success. So every business should start with time, money, people. You predetermine the time to reach your audience. How much money is it going to take with a business performer to cover your costs in that time frame? And then last, what people? Well, in the reverse, what people that then create the performer so you have the money to hire. I started studios as soon as I started and I hired Dylan. Like I I hired him before we opened the doors, right? And then I had my visionary of the company before we opened the doors. I wanted that in place so I wasn't a resource to the company. I'm confused on one piece. Please. You weren't the visionary of that company? No, I don't consider myself a visionary. I consider myself an innovator, right? And so I like to start new things and then I like to give it to a visionary. Visionary takes an already preconceived concept and sees where he needs to take it. An innovator creates it. Okay. So I can be a visionary. I don't really want to be a visionary. A visionary is the CEO of that business unit. And that's a resource. (laughs) Yep. They still have to network. They still have to build big relationships. They still have to do those things. I don't want to do that. Like, why would I want to do that? I want to live in the area of coaching if I want to, if I still want to coach. And I want to live in the area of the CEO of the whole ecosystem, right? When you talk to me, you're going to talk to me about all our businesses. If you were to talk to Jacob, who's my visionary of the Sharper Studios, he's going to talk to you about the studios. That's his focus. Yeah. His job is making money, proof concept, and get 50 more open, him and Dylan, around the country in the next five years. 
That's not my goal. That's his goal. Very, very interesting. I think I it's want to be a resource, man. Like that's the biggest waste of time for an entrepreneur is to be a resource. If you want to be a self-employed business owner, then be a resource. If you want to be an owner of a business, then be an owner. Everybody thinks that visionary is the owner's box. It's not. There's a box above the visionary called owner's box. The director of the board, you know, like that's the seat I want to sit in. I don't want to sit in the seat of visionary. So if we're listening and we've built businesses where we are involved in the business, what would be a suggestion or a recommendation of how do we replace ourselves in that case? It's scary. It's yeah. frightening, honestly. Uh, sometimes our identity is wrapped really? around what we were doing. It's true. Uh, other times we think, well, if I got to get somebody else in here, I'm probably going to lose money or how do I afford it? How do I pay myself and that person? So there's a lot of in our heads of concern if we're trying to replace ourselves. What would your suggestion be to a listener who does want to replace themselves? You know, if it's their only business, it's the first business they already started and it's a big part of their salary and how they pay their bills and all I truly most of the time is, is you have to put in a business operating framework. That's why I wrote the book Rise, Rise Business Framework. It's so that you put a framework in place that allows you to start letting go, whether it's systems or processes or people or things like that. You have to start succession planning for key roles. And so a part of the resource day that we do when we work with somebody is we identify all the seats in your organization and what seats you're sitting in. We call it the process ownership chart. Who's the owner of each one of these processes? And then we look at that and go, which ones do you desire? Which ones do you have the natural ability behavioral to set in? Which ones do you have the experience set in? And which ones do you see yourself growing with? And any of those that you don't have what we call the heart, the head, the hands, the feet for, then I need to create a succession plan around you to replace you in that seat with somebody that has the heart, the head, the hands, feet. When I wrote it, Adam, I wrote it as a rhyme. Heart, head, hands, feet tell you if you're in the right seat, right? So it's a way to remember whether or not you're in the right seats in your own company. Do you desire it? Do you have the natural behavior to do that job properly? If you don't, you're going to burn out, right? Like if you're in sales in your own company and you don't have the desire to follow up, you're risk adverse, which means if you're risk adverse, you don't like being told no. So why would you sit in sales? Because over time, it's going to drain your energy, right? And so anything that doesn't fit the heart, the head, the hands, the feet, and you're in that seat, I'm going to start succession planning for you. We're going to start identifying what the right person looks like for that seat. And we're going to start to find a way to replace ourselves in that seat. Does personality tests go involved with this at all? And if so, how does that work? Well, with the heart, I use like find your mojo, which tells me desire. And then it lines up with that position. Then with the head, it's behavior. So I'm looking for a behavioral assessment tool like predictive index. And that's what we use to make sure that you have the right behaviors to do that job. Then I'm looking at your skills, your hands. I'm looking for resumes. That's the assessment, right? Is a job interview. That's how I'm assessing you. And then with your mobility or your feet, the ability to grow the seat or grow with the seat, I would use something like working genius, right? I'd look at that assessment and see whether or not you have a long-term potential. Because what we're looking for, Adam, is in a seat, we're looking for what's the long-term potential and what's the performance of that person? So the heart and the hands tell us how you're going to perform. Your desire and your skills will tell me how you perform in that seat. It has nothing to do with your behavioral traits, like a predictive index. Yeah. Behavioral traits tell me your potential for long term. Yeah. It just tells me how long you're going to do it before you burn out. We use this as well. So when we hire our teammates, we use the PI predictive index. So we are subscribed to PI, which means that we have got an account with them. And so we'll create a job model and then we'll have hundreds of people take it. And then we'll get down to like 17 that will fit that. And then we'll vet them that way. And it goes with what you said. We've noticed that when we hire people, they stay in the seat for a long, long time. Right. And a lot of people working, we also help with virtual assistants. I've got a small business that supports people to get a VA and we will use the PI every single time. And not everybody understands how powerful it is. And I always say it's like 
you're getting somebody in the Philippines, they might really need money that week. You know, somebody who's looking for a job, regardless of the country, they right. might need money. And they have the ability, they're smart enough to figure out something, a role. Mm -hmm. You can put them in that role. But if their personality isn't for that role, then they're only going to last a short amount of time. Right. And then they're right. going to leave and you're going to have to rehire. Yeah. So I like that you do that. And you've got a way to vet them for their heart, head, hands, and feet. I think we do a little bit with some of those, but not maybe to the extent that you do. So is that in a book that you've written then? Yeah. The book Rise. It's all in there, the RISE business framework, and it's our RISE business curriculum. So what we do then, Adam, is we take those assessments, heart, head, hands, feet, and then we evaluate you in the seat based on a nine box evaluation. And the nine box will evaluate, are you below expectations and potential meets or exceeds? And then on the other side, it's like, are you below expectations and performance meets or exceeds? So if somebody has the desire and they have a resume of 20 years doing the job that you're hiring them to do, right? That's okay. high performance. That's a three out of three in performance. But Adam, they may not have the right predictive index to do that job. They might be a one in potential. And what does that tell me? That tells me they've done exactly what they had to do for 20 years in that job. Mm -hmm. And they're a half to employ, not a want to employ. So they just do what they have to do. What George Carlin said, most people work hard enough not to get fired and get paid just enough not to quit. And that's a workhorse, right? That is somebody who is high performance, low potential. On the other side of that, I could have somebody who's a 10 out of 10 MPI with no experience. So that means that they're high potential, low performance right now. Now, with experience and with their IPI, they could gain better performance. And if they do, then now they're a 3-3, three, three, and that's what we call an all-star right? If they are high potential, high performance. So we evaluate these people, the heart, head, hand, and the feet based on potential and performance and which one of the nine boxes they fall in. And I have a nine box in the RISE curriculum for each area of resource, inspiration, systems, engagement. So the one I described to you was resources. Inspiration, now I want to make sure you're the right person. And so we have a nine box that evaluates whether or not we trust you with our core values and whether you align with our company vision. Mm-hmm. That tells me if you're the right person, because what I don't want, Adam, is I don't want a rock star person in a seat, but then be the wrong person for my company. Yep. In my book, my fable about Matt Wellington, and he's a real estate entrepreneur, he hires a guy named Bob. And guess what Bob does for him? Bob was ex-car sales, and he crushes it in the sales seat for him. He's bringing in tons of contracts and buying new houses. But guess what? Nobody likes Bob. Because Bob doesn't fit the culture. He's not the right person. And they end up having to let him go. And it hurts their company because they had the wrong person sitting in the right seat. We don't want the wrong person in the right seat. We don't want the right person in the wrong seat either. We don't want everybody that everybody loves, core values and vision, that doesn't perform or doesn't have the potential to grow that seat. So we don't want either one of those combinations. We want the right person in the right seat. Rise is very tactical in explaining how to measure those things, where all the other business operating systems out there just say, get the right person in the right seat. I was so tired of that, Adam. I'm like, no, I want to know how to put the right person in the right seat, right? And that's what we built with the nine box. We actually take that into process and we evaluate, is it valuable to our customer and is it essential to our business? And we have a nine box around that. And then with marketing, your podcast, you have to ask the question, is it scalable and is it profitable, right? Those are the two sides to the nine box, the system I have there. But all that's in our Rise Business Framework book that's being produced and published right now. But in the meantime, that's what we coach people on, man. We spend time with people helping them get to their 100% by helping them take that concept, that idea, that passion that you have right now, create the right resources with time, money, and people inspire those resources with the right vision, short-term and long-term. We always tell you long-term visions about inspiration, short-terms about results. And then we put systems around it, right? Those resources need the right systems for you to let go and get out of the seats. And then if we do all that really well in the proof of the concept, it's scalable and it's profitable, then we go to engagement and we start to expand. And that's really where our podcast, and that's where Sharper is right now, right? We're in a place right now where we have served over 2,000 businesses. We have all the right resources, all the right vision, all the right systems in place. Now I want to hit millions. So we're in engagement, right? And hence the point of the podcast. The podcast yeah. now is to allow us to reach more people, get our message out there, help more entrepreneurs, and influence and impact people 
in the millions. Are you planning on marketing the podcast to get it in front of people? And if so, what's your plan there? Yeah. So the book is going to be a precursor to the podcast. We're going to market it organically to our current audience, bring on social media and other influencers to co-collaborate with other people as well. That's a way to do it. But one of the bigger things is the funnel with the company that I've chosen to do our publishing is they will funnel people to the podcast from the book and to our uh, other funnels within the organization. So, But the bigger one will be the funnel to the podcast, right? Okay. And to our online social. So the two books that are launching that I've been told by both publishers are excellently written, excellently depiculated uh, as to how it's going to help. They believe that they're easily going to be able to get tens of thousands of people to read these books. And that's how we're going to try to push as many people to our podcast. Cool. Last question, because we are short on time. So I just was curious, if somebody had the 20 years experience, but they were a one in the predictive index, Mm -hmm. their personality for the job, the question is, is three one better or is one three better? Because they both, I think, add up to four, for example, or whatever. Would it be better that somebody has the personality for it, the drive for it, but no experience? Or would it be better that they have years and years and years experience, but not the right personality? If you had a pick, are they equal or does one trump the other? Well, there's less risk in the three one of performance over potential. Because you can measure results. You can see results. They've had experience with it. You're guessing at the 3-1. You got to understand and look at it this way. Someone who's a 10 out of 10 in potential and they're a 1 in performance because they don't know if they have desire, they've never done it before, they don't have the resume for it, they don't have the experience, then it's like having a six foot eleven basketball player who's never shot a basketball, right? Like, could they make it to the NBA? Yeah. But if their heart doesn't show up, they ain't going to play that game very well. Okay. Right? Is it the even or is one better? The safer, yeah, the safer is... route would be experience. Okay, got it. That's just safer. That doesn't mean it's the right answer. It's just a safer answer. I don't always lean on the line of safe. Sometimes I'm willing to take the gamble on seeing how they shoot the ball when I put it in their hands. Yeah. Right? So it really comes down to your risk tolerance as an entrepreneur. For me, I don't mind the 3-1 in high potential, low performance and see if the performance shows up. But I'm also not one to hold people very long either. Like if you don't hit performance in 90 days, you're probably not going to stay with my company. So yeah. like I probably go the route of high potential and then measure performance and see how it works. Now, obviously, the ideal candidate is somebody who has potential and performance. Yeah. Right. They're at least a 2-2. Two, two. They're a 2 in potential, an 8 out of 10 in PI, and they've got some experience or a 2-2. Two, two, they've showed some results. That's who I'm really going after, right? But if I have to choose between a 3-1 performance or 3-1 potential, me personally, I'm probably going to 3-1 potential. Other people might go 3-1 performance just because it's safer. Yeah. There's no wrong answer here. Is there anything you've learned for podcasting that you would like to share with a listener right now? Is there anything you can think of? I know you're getting right back into it. It's being republished as we speak. Is there something you wanted to share before we jump off? Yeah, I think two things I learned. One is don't make it about you. It's not about okay. you. It's about your audience. Number two, be consistent. <laughs> right? That's a lesson learned right there. Like be consistent. Stick with it. Anything worth doing, you have to put time and effort into, and it's got to be repetitive. I learned the other day with social media, for example, I coach a lot of social media influencers. If I name their names, you would know who they are too, Adam. But the average time from the time they become consistent to actually starting to get algorithms picking them up and pushing their content is like 14 months right now. That's so it's like they put out seven pieces of content a day for 14 months before it started taking off. I love it. Well, let's jump off. The two big things that we're leaving with is it's not about you. It's about the listener Mm -hmm. and consistency. It's going to probably take time, like 14 months or whatever, for you to be in front of your right people. So be patient, jump in and just keep consistent through the whole route. Gary, all of your links to any businesses you wanted us to know about, those are in the show notes. Your bio is in the show notes. And additionally, your podcast is in the show notes so that my listener can jump over and check out your show by scrolling down and clicking. The next episode's a shorter episode. So if you're listening to this one, awesome. It's been good to have you. And the next one, I think, is really curated for you. It's got some really good information. I don't want you to miss it. So I'll see you on the next episode. If you're glad that you checked out the podcast today, if you got some value, 
out of this episode, some actionable takeaways, I invite you to do one of three things. A, you could do a written review on Apple. Let us know what you think. Just an honest written review. B, you could share the podcast with a friend of yours who needs it. Or C, at the very least, implement what you've learned to take your business and your podcast to the next level. And I'll see you on the next episode.